I'm going to be reading this morning from Luke chapter 5. It says, one day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee, Judea, and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform miracles. And some men were carrying a man on a stretcher who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of him. But when they did not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees began thinking of the implications, saying, Who is this man who speaks flat blasphemies? Who can forgive sins except God alone? But Jesus, aware of their thoughts, responded and said to them, Why are you thinking this way in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. And immediately he got up before them and he picked up what he had been lying on and he went home glorifying God. And they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were also filled with fear saying, we have seen remarkable things today. Well, you know, the Bible is told in summary form. But we are expected to read it as if these are men and women made in the image of God. We're told that in Psalm 139. Give them a name. Wonder what it was like to maybe walk in their shoes. Well, this morning, we are going to attempt to do just that. We're going to fill in some details. We're going to use our imagination. But while still all the while being faithful to the scripture. My name is Josiah, and I am a Pharisee. I am actually an elite Pharisee, if you will. I am on the Sanhedrin. I grew up in Jerusalem. I studied right there in Jerusalem underneath the great Pharisee Gamaliel. I was the first in my class to learn all 613 laws. You know, truth be told, I had established myself as an elite debater. They, they gave me the name Pitbull. I mean, they knew that, that uh, when it was debate time that I would press in and I would intimidate them. What well, we had heard about another wannabe Messiah rising up in the northern region way up in Galilee. These, these wannabe messiahs had popped up a number of times. You know, truth be told, Sheep are so easy to be led astray. You can get people to just follow you wherever you want. You just tell them what they want to hear. They want to overthrow the Romans. And, and you know, there's a little sleight of hand and things like that. And, and they will follow you. This one in particular, his name was, was Jesus, and he, he was up in this northern region. They, they had said that he had been casting out demons and healing people. No doubt a sleight of hand. And then he would teach. He would teach, and he said that he had brought about the kingdom of God. 
Now, now pause for a second and, and think about this. Uh, do you think that the Messiah of God would come to a bunch of peasants in northern Galilee? I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think very long about that. There is no way. If you were the Messiah, if you were sent by God, would you go to a bunch of peasants way up north, not in Jerusalem, not to the religious leaders, not to those who are closest to God like, well, me? And so I was sent on a month-long journey to go from Jerusalem and to travel all the way up to Galilee. It would take me weeks to get there and weeks to get back. I would have to leave my wife and my family, but it was for the cause of God and I was willing. And I was certainly going to expose this con man for, well, who he was. As I entered into Galilee, I had learned that this Jesus had gone back to his hometown of Capernaum. And that's where I would find him, in his own home. The morning I got up and made my way, there was already a large crowd there, and he had already worked them into a frenzy, as you can imagine. But as a Pharisee, as a leader, I made my way through the crowd, I entered his home, and I took my seat of honor, where finally I was face to face with this uneducated carpenter. I was in good company. There were a number of other scribes and Pharisees who had made their way to check him out. And I didn't think it would take very long for us to really put some pressure and expose this juvenile scam. But question after question, he, he knew God's word more than I do. And and he taught like no one I had ever heard before, with such authority. And, and just, we would ask him all these difficult questions that, that us and the Sadducees had debated about for, for years. And just when it looked like someone was going to pin him down and corner him, suddenly just, he would switch it around. People stopped asking him questions. <laughs> and as he taught, I wouldn't say this out loud to anyone else, but I will tell you, there was this burning, this conviction inside. Now suddenly, in the midst of all of this hot theological debate, there was this debris that started to fall from the ceiling. This noise, <laughs> what was that, a shovel? And then suddenly there, there are chunks falling and, and bits and pieces of the roof are peeled back until there's a hole in the roof. And then wouldn't you know it, this absolutely worthless peasant is lowered down right there in the midst of our meeting. I mean, the nerve of it all. We're in the middle of important theological debate and, and these peasants have the nerve to just interrupt and break. I looked at Jesus and I wondered, is he going to get control of this situation? The, the nerve of this, is he going to take control? We are doing important things here. And he just had this smile upon his face. Amen. It was... Annoying. But he looked at this paralyzed peasant that had been lowered right there in front of us, and then he uttered these. He looked at him and he said, Your sins are forgiven you. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. I was 
angry with, with the anger of God. God would not tolerate such language. Who does he think? Only God can forgive sins. Blasphemy. And in an instant, he looked right at me. And he said, what do you think it's easier to say that his sins are forgiven or to prove to you that God is with me and to say, get up, you are healed. And then I'll never forget what happened next. Because right there in front of my very eyes, he healed him. He healed him. A paralyzed man walked. How? How could he do that if God is not with him? I haven't slept in days. I know what I saw. You see, the whole town is a buzz. They keep saying, well, surely God is with him. Surely he is sent by God. But how could that be? What do they expect me to do? I'm supposed to go back to Jerusalem and to report. What am I to do? See, church, what I love about this account in the detailing, as the scripture specifically says, that Pharisees came up from Jerusalem and right there before their very eyes, they see the God himself and he heals them. He heals a paralytic. And at that moment, they are forced to make a decision. They can either surrender to who Jesus is, surrender, realizing that it's the Holy Spirit of God that is speaking to them in that very moment, that is crying out to them, and they can surrender. It'll force them to humble themselves and admit that everything that they've ever thought about God has been wrong. Or they can fill their mind with endless excuses. But I'm most interested in you this morning. Because I genuinely believe there are so many times in your life when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and is calling you to himself. God says, if you seek me, you will find me. And you and I are faced with the exact same situation. Will we surrender to the truth of who God is? As God begins to pull back the blinders on our eyes, the scripture presses you and it says, you will be held accountable for these moments. How horrifying for this Pharisee, whenever he faces God in eternity and says, my son healed someone right before your very eyes. And you filled your mind with excuses. What will those moments be for you, dear friend? When you filled your mind with excuses to find any other way. My name is Eli, and I am Joseph's best friends. In fact, there were five of us growing up, and we were inseparable. Uh, his, J Joseph's parents, they're, they're like a second family to me. We hung out all the time. And let me tell you about Joseph. He, he was always the most athletic, and oh, you should have seen him run. I mean, I'll tell you secretly, I was envious and I always hated it because I could never beat him. Man, I wouldn't give anything to see him run again. 
I was there the day of the accident. In fact, Joseph, being such a good friend, had come over to my farm and, and was helping us. We wanted to get seed in before the rains came. And Joseph came uh, selflessly to come over and to help us. And, and it, it had already begun to rain and it had gotten a little muddy. And, and uh, Joseph got out before the oxen. I was driving from the back and he was in front and he was pulling along and he slipped. And all I heard was a scream. As the oxen stepped on his back. And he had been paralyzed from that day forward. I used to go visit him. I mean, I still do, but through the years, I just saw the, the light dim. I could see it in his eyes. He was a shell of his former self. I knew that God was up to something because Jesus was headed back to town. You see, he had, he had already healed a number of people right there in Capernaum. He had performed many healings. And when I heard him teach about the kingdom of God, my soul just leapt within me. But, but not just for me, for Joseph too. I couldn't help but think of Joseph, how he needed to hear this message. It was, it was so filled with hope and Joseph needed this hope. And so when I heard that Jesus was coming back into town, I, I, had, I, I ran and I, I grabbed the rest of our gang, our friends, and I said, we have got to get to Joseph's house. We have to get him to the feet of Jesus. Whatever it takes, if we can get him to the feet of Jesus, everything will change. Everything will change. Jesus will, he, he needs this hope. And so we, we showed up with the, the stretcher and, and Joseph was resistant. He, he kept giving excuses. He kept telling us to go away, but we would not take no for an answer. We, we, we know you get on here. It is for your good. Come on. And I was so filled with hope and, until I turned the corner to Jesus' house. And my heart sank as I saw just row after row. The, the crowd was, was probably 10, 15 rows deep. There was, there was no way through. And, and our heads, they all dropped as... as we, Maybe this wasn't God's plan. But I looked at Joseph. I looked him right in the eyes and I said, no, not today. We have got to find a way through. We have got to get him to the feet of Jesus. And, and suddenly I had an idea. I looked at the crowd and I realized that they were all around the front, all around the door. There, they, there may have been this huge crowd, but around the backside, well, well, no one was waiting on the backside. And then I thought, what if we lower him through the roof? I mean, of course, what? Yeah, what if we lower him through the roof? You mean dig through the roof and break apart the structure in Jesus' house in order to lower Joseph in front of Jesus? I mean, what's everyone going to think? I mean, what if Jesus gets furious because we're breaking his roof? I mean, we all agreed right there in that moment. We would come back and we would fix his roof. We had to. We had to fix the roof. But what, what would the crowd say? We didn't care. 
We didn't care because we looked at Joseph and we had to get him to the feet of Jesus. And so we went around back and, and we, we hoisted it up on the roof. It wasn't easy, but we finally got up there and we got up there with a shovel. And, and I can remember I'm standing up and it's about time to dig this in. And suddenly the crowd begins to look at us and they begin to shout. They begin, what are you doing? And, and this is the point of no return, right? And and there we go, that first crunch. You can imagine all the debating inside. It has stopped there looking up, debris falling. We fight our way through. The Pharisees are furious. But Jesus just smiled. He, he just smiled as, as he looked at this scene. And he healed him. He healed him. And my friend is back. He's, he healed him. I knew that if we could get him to the feet of Jesus, he would be healed. How are we being intentional about your witness? I want, you to, I want us to learn from the friends, right? Sure, there are excuses. How many excuses could they have made? Their friend is paralyzed. There's a large crowd. They're digging through a roof. But what about your excuses? We're too busy. Well, adjust your priorities. Are we going to sit silent while our loved ones around us go to hell? Who's going to tell them if those who love Jesus don't? But I don't know what to say. I'm afraid I'll look foolish. I'm afraid they'll reject me. Did you know that surveys conclude that 80% of people are open to spiritual conversations if someone would just ask them? So let's be like these friends. Let's have courage. Let's take risks. Let's persevere. Let's be creative. Let's be driven by this one all-consuming thought. If I could just get them to the feet of Jesus. And allow the Holy Spirit and Jesus to do all the work. Do you really believe that Jesus is the answer for every soul we encounter? As Peter said in Acts 4.12, no other name has been given under heaven by which you must be saved. Paul says, for I could wish I were accursed on the sake of my brethren. And so I ask you this morning, who is your Joseph? Who is your Joseph? That right now, God is going to lay upon your heart and you are going to pray for, that you are going to pursue with cre creativity, with sacrifice, with perseverance, that you're going to take risk, that you're going to get courage and boldness and start that conversation. Who is your Joseph? Because we are all called to bring our friends to Jesus. I know Eli told you guys about the accident.
Every time I think about it, I just have nightmares. All I want is to go back to before. I feel like my life is a waste. Like I'm a burden on all those around me. I don't talk about it much, but there, there is a darkness that creeps in. And all I want to do is be alone, but I don't want to be alone. And there's an anger and a bitterness as other people continue to live their lives and they are happy, and I simply say, well, what about mine? I'm ashamed to tell you what I was thinking about the day my friend showed up. I was so filled with hurt and anger. And more than anything, I was angry at God. I mean, is, is life supposed to be all suffering? Just, just sit by with, with no light, no hope? What did I do to deserve this? They, they told me they were going to take me to this, this Jesus, but I, I resisted. I, I told them no. I told them no, but they, they insisted. They were, they were so filled with hope. They were so filled with, with this excitement, and I have no idea why. And, and then when we got there, and there was the large crowd, I, I told them to stop again. But they insisted. They kept pressing forward. They kept saying, you need to see Jesus. And when they lowered me in front of him, it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. When he looked at me, on one hand, for the first time, th there was hope. I could sense and feel the love of God like I had never in my entire life. But at the same time, as he looked into me, I could tell that he was looking into my soul and that he could see, he could perceive all the darkness that was inside of me. Oh, it didn't matter. I could not hide. There was nowhere to run. He could look and he could see the darkness and peering straight into that darkness. He, he said, my sins were forgiven. All of a sudden, in an instant, this weight was lifted off of me. It, it was gone. It, and I realized that all along, what what I had, I had been enslaved to my sin. I had been enslaved to this darkness that had overcome me. I kept wanting my circumstances to be changed. I kept thinking if I could go back, if I could go back, and if those would just change, then I would be fine. But I realized now that it was all along, it was my sin. It was my sin because laying right there before him, still paralyzed, I was, I was whole. Like I had a joy that flooded over me in that instant. And I was whole. I was happier than I could ever be. And then the the Pharisees and him, they, they got into this argument about what he had said to me about my sins being forgiven. And then in an instant, he reaches down and he, he touched my back. And there was this warmth that 
went through my, it started in my back and it went all the way. I hadn't felt my legs in 20 years and suddenly there was this warmth that went all the way through them and in an instant, I got up. Many of you are here today and you're in need of hope. Beaten down by your circumstances, found, finding them overwhelming, and that life is more difficult than you can bear. What you think you need is for Jesus to change your circumstances. And that may be true, but that's for him to decide. What I can tell you is that he is using the circumstances and the trials of your life right now to bring you to himself. And what it means for you to become face to face with Jesus will always mean for him to look directly at your sins and to do business with them. The great news is that he forgives them. It's why he came. Church, it's at this moment that we have the honor and privilege of moving towards the Lord's Supper. If you are at home and you are able to come by and grab the elements, then I invite you to, to take the Lord's Supper with us. The Lord's Supper is a picture of the gospel. With the breaking of Jesus' body and his blood poured out as a new covenant. Truth be told, it is for born again believers. For those who have come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's just juice and a cracker. And it can do nothing for you. But for those of us who have been born again, it is a remembrance. It is a reminder of the hope that we have seen displayed this morning, the hope of the gospel, the hope of the gospel, that above all things, Jesus Christ enters into our sin and his body was broken on our behalf. And so would you go ahead and peel back the top layer and pull out the bread? If you are born again, you are invited to participate and to take this with us. I want you to hold the bread in your hand and we're going to take it together. But as you hold the bread, I want you to contemplate his broken body. I want you to contemplate the hope that is there for those who call upon his name. I want you to contemplate how he enters in and deals with your sin. Take just a moment to reflect and to confess the scripture warns us that we should not take this in an inappropriate manner. But an appropriate manner is when we confess our sins, remember rightly that he is our only hope. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body. And now I want you to take the cup. Go ahead and peel it back and get it ready.
While you hold it there, I want you to look at it. I want you to draw the obvious significance of Jesus' blood, which he says is the new covenant. It also pictures the hope, this side of the cross, and the forgiveness and the joy of knowing your sins are forgiven. You see, it's difficult to talk about our sins, but when we're willing and able to do so, to humble ourselves, we realize that on the other side is victory. He never leaves us in our sin. He gives us victory. And so in the quietness of your heart right now, I want you to pause and I want you to reflect on the joy that Jesus gives. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are so approachable. That we can come to you. Even if we've come to you and confessed a million times before, you never stop forgiving. You never stop redeeming. Thank you, Jesus. I pray right now for any under the sound of my voice that do not know you as personal Lord and Savior, that right now your Holy Spirit would begin to stir up faith and life and that they would know what it means to kneel at the foot of the cross to declare that they have no hope for their sin besides you and to place all of their faith, all of their hope, all of their trust in the finished work of your work on the cross and that they would make you king, that they would humble themselves that they would know the joy of you being their king. Lord Jesus, forgive us for our lack of intentionality in bringing our friends to you. And I pray for every born-again believer under the sound of my voice that your Holy Spirit would press upon it each and every heart who their Joseph is. Give us a heartbeat for the lost. Give us the boldness. Give us the courage. Give us the creativity and the perseverance, Jesus, to bring our friends to your feet because we trust that the Holy Spirit and you do all the work. You just call us to love. You just call us to love the people around us. Forgive us, Jesus, when we fall short. Give us the courage to walk worthy. We pray all of that in your holy name, amen.